The road to platinum continues, and of course last week in the first episode I featured four different events with differing results as far as success and certainly different kinds of driver in terms of skill level. This time around I decided to up the ante and do each of the new events, A, B and C, a couple of times each. So now I've jumped from having four complete to ten. And with those ten now complete, I kind of also had the realisation, it's a pretty obvious one really, but the realisation that I don't actually need to necessarily showcase every single second and every single highlight from every single race. Since I'm just working toward the goal of getting 50, it will be a lot shorter of a series if I skim over some of the stuff and just feature some of the interesting moments or some of the better or particularly bad stuff. Of course, pretty obvious thing to do. So this time around, like I said, I did two of each. Race A, first of all, I'm not going to dwell on for too long. It's the Nissan 370Z spec event at Tsukuba. I don't know if it's just me, I'm sure I'm saying something which everyone else already long knows, but it seems that race A attracts the, let's say, lowest common denominator of driver. There were certainly much more bash happy people. One of the races I ended up getting into a bit of a back and forth with one particular player, which was a total waste of time, and the arc for this week was me dropping my sportsmanship rating from, what was it, on an S, I think, all the way down to B, and then coming all the way back up to S again by the end of this episode. So it's an interesting little hero to villain back to hero arc. <laughs> and there was actually one race which I quite enjoyed out of these ones. It was one of the later ones at Daytona. I'm sure some of you raced there as well this week. Now, on those Sakuba events, the first one was just an absolute mess. It was small brains attracted to race A. That, that's literally the note that I wrote about this particular race. And the second time around, and you'll notice that the times in the videos kind of jump back and forth because I didn't do two of them back to back. Again, I don't know if it's just me, I guess it must be me, but twice now in race A with these standard vehicles, last time with the LFA, this time with the Nissan, it seems to me like the physics are quite inconsistent. I don't understand if it is me because that does not seem to happen anywhere near as much. In fact, it didn't really happen at all that I can remember in race B or C for that matter last week or this week. It seems to be just race A. The Nissan's braking distances, just like the Lexus, seem wildly inconsistent. And even though Gran Turismo tries to be realistic, it's never really come across to me like the kind of game that actually has brake fade. I mean, that was actually one of my points about the movie. The Gran Turismo movie made a big deal about brake fade, and it's just not something that's ever been a part of Gran Turismo. And even with stuff like tyres getting worse, yes, it's definitely a factor. But in a short race at Sakuba, by lap 2 or lap 3, starting to feel a bit weird compared to the previous ones, or even compared to the qualifying time, it doesn't make sense for the car to radically change that much. Ultimately, it seemed to me, especially with the, what is it, lack, I think, of driver rating increase that I hadn't noticed that you don't get that, really, in these race A events, it seems to me like you kind of only stand to lose stuff in this, because unless you, and again this was a realisation I had, and this is a bigger issue that I'm going to come back to over the course of this episode, which I kind of have with sport mode, and I'm sure that I'm preaching to the choir here for the most part, because most of the complaints that I've heard from people with regard to sport mode in GT7, and to some degree in GT Sport, revolve around the penalties. Now I can definitely already more than agree with that. There were times when people would bash into me and get no penalty, then I would clip a corner for example later on at Daytona, and end up with like a second penalty for something which did not save me a second of time, and certainly did not warrant anything more than half a second, if anything. So it is wildly inconsistent, and it seems like they're kind of trying to use an algorithm to determine the intention of somebody's driving. That is a dangerous game to play, because a machine is good at a lot of things, but determining what somebody meant to do is not one of them. A machine can only work with what it has, which is the facts, and the facts is the end result, not why you did it. So you could have two things that look very similar, but for example when I bash into someone I'm sure multiple times in different races by accident, maybe I braked a little bit too late, or again misjudged the physics of the tyres or the car, well that clearly wasn't deliberate, and I always make up for that by braking, holding back and letting the person take the position back that I took from them. On the other hand, you could have someone full-on bash into you, and the end result seems to be the same. You could say, well, the game will 
see how you react after. It will see if you actually try to break or not. I'm sure there's some of that going on here, but nowhere near enough for me to fully buy into that idea. The thing that I realized though, in terms of these events, and I've probably moved on by now to the Dragon Trail stuff anyway, the first time around I used the Suzuki Group 4 car. Second time around, I decided to change it. Again, just have a little bit of fun. I wasn't even attempting to pick the best choices necessarily, because as soon as you jump into the room, you'll see that most people tend to use the same stuff over and over again, which again, I find obvious as something which always happens in games, but also incredibly boring. So I chose the Alfa Romeo. I definitely found that the Alfa 155 was a much better choice at Dragon Trail than the Suzuki. I thought the Suzuki might give me an advantage through corners, but the Alfa Romeo, certainly with this balance of performance and this track, was so much more fun to use. It seemed so much more competitive. Of course, I was still nowhere near the victory, but I didn't really care about that. I was more concerned with seeing where I began, how many points or how many places even I could raise. And to come back to the realization that I had, I think one of the problems with how sport mode works, at least in GT7, and this is something which I have to say in other games that I've raced online in, such as Forza or even older Gran Turismo games, to be honest, they're kind of engendering the wrong thing with the way they're doing this. Because the problem with sport mode in GT7 is you have one of two things going on. You can either go for the victory or in all likelihood lose at least some sportsmanship points because of the kind of contact that's going to be traded with other people and the kind of of inevitable corner cutting that's going to happen etc or you can hang back which i tried as a little test and it definitely worked just hang back don't try and necessarily always go for the victory and you'll find that your sportsmanship will rock it up even though it's kind of the antithesis of the whole point of racing you're no longer trying to win you're just trying not to be a bumper car it kind of encourages you to be more safe and I think there is a sweet spot between those two. You need to encourage and engender a, an atmosphere where people go for the win but still have mutual respect. And again, it could be an issue where it's because of the lobbies and because of the level that I'm being matched with. That could always be a factor, but that shouldn't be a factor. It should be, I mean, this is the problem that I'm saying. When you have a system that works this way, where you bunch people with the same scores together, you are inevitably going to end up with rooms full of people who just bash into each other. Well, the problem is then, on the one hand, you could say, sure, they deserve to be, and clearly they're compatible with each other, but we're not trying to encourage that, are we? We're trying to encourage people to grow out of that. We're trying to encourage people to see that there's a better way than that. So by shoving them all in a room where that is going to continue, it's basically the same problem as like a prison system. You put a bunch of people who are seasoned criminals in with people who are petty criminals, and the average quality of criminal is going to go up, not down. So when you put them in a room together this way, you're not really encouraging anyone to be a better driver. You're just segregating people into bad drivers and better drivers with very little crossover and, crucially, very little reason to be anything but that. And I think that's a shame because I know that Kaz would want drivers to be better. Clearly, that is something hugely important to him. He loves the racing side of things, and that definitely needs improving. Not only this week, I'm sure next week, and definitely last week, you can see how badly this system works. You end up in rooms with people who, as I said, just have no reason to be better, because they keep getting matched with people who are like them. I ended up dropping down into those rooms. I could see some of those attitudes. And the only way that I got back out of them is by operating and driving in the total opposite way to anyone else in the room, which was essentially deliberately losing, but having a super clean race so that my score rocketed back up. So I guess that's kind of a bit of a cheat for people who want to end up in a higher class room, I guess, or at least it must have some kind of effect on the rooms that you'll end up in, I would imagine. But still, it's, it's definitely a system that needs improving. As far as the Dragon Trail stuff goes, it was 50-50. It was definitely more enjoyable, as I said, with the Alfa Romeo. I decided to hang back, had more of a restrained strategy. It was certainly a lot better of a race than with the Suzuki. There were some fun moments with the Suzuki, but one of the penalties, I don't recall exactly where it was, but I'll probably show it. It was just absolute BS, as far as I'm concerned, the penalty that I got. Uh, if I recall correctly, I think it was a player who was quite close, but not in you know a sportsman-like way, who was kind of weaving around a little bit around us. I didn't really see much of a chance for an overtake, and I wasn't really going for one necessarily, but then on that really, you know, Monaco-esque part of Dragon Trail towards the end where you've got the square corners, he ended up just slamming straight into a wall. That was pretty obviously going to happen, which is why I took the inside line to go around him. And then I got a penalty for that. And I feel like the way the penalty works is just that I was probably the last person to touch his car. That is 
Such a bad way of doing things. I mean, that's essentially like how the road works in China, where if you're the last person to touch someone, you're responsible for whatever happened to them. That is a dumbass system, and they need to get rid of that, because that is just bad. <laughs> that's a woefully inadequate way of doing things. But as we move into the last couple of events that I did this time around, these ones were a lot more fun. The first time I used the Beetle, the Beetle back in GT Sport was always my go-to. I would represent Volkswagen, and it was a solid all-round car. I know some people find the Beetle to be maybe a bit overrated, or at least they did back then. I'm not so sure these days. Didn't really see anyone else using the Beetle, which surprises me because it feels like a pretty solid all-rounder still in GT7. Not necessarily the quickest in a straight line, not necessarily the best through corners, but pretty good at both. And I decided to use a different strategy here because, of course, last week I had my minute penalty for not pitting in at Catalonia. This time around I thought, you know what, what I'm going to do is, since the fuel can clearly last the whole race and the tyres aren't too bad either, I'm going to pit in straight away, right at the end of lap one, and then my strategy was hopefully catch up and pass a few of the people when they inevitably pit in later on. Because if you've got to pit in at some point, you may as well do it early and get it done. I already knew I wasn't going to win the race, so let's just try it and see what happens. The thing that bugged me in this race was that even though it was overall decently good, it was decent fun with that pit one strategy, it was a 50-50 race overall. Some of the racing action was fun, of course I was nowhere near the front of the grid, didn't expect to be, but the fuel use really bugged me in this one, because even though I didn't obviously pause or stop the race to do any quick math and work out how long my fuel was going to last, I had the fuel map turned a little bit down for a while, and then it seemed from the projection of how long it was going to last that I should have more than enough to drop it down a little bit. And even when I dropped the fuel map down to one, it was still looking like I should have had enough fuel for more than the entire race, like maybe 11 laps instead of 10. But then by the time the race ended, you'll probably see, doubtless you will, I ran out of fuel at the end, and it was almost a photo finish because I still managed to retain my place despite the other player coming up quick. But that really bugged me as well because it almost, and I'm sure it isn't, but it almost does feel arbitrary sometimes, like the game is trying to turn up the, the drama factor. You know, like for example, and this is going to be controversial for many people because I know lots of you love Formula One, many people do. Uh, recently, unless this was a, a bogus article, but I believe it was true, Michelin spoke about why they don't do tyres for Formula One. They refuse to make bad quality tyres, in effect, that are deliberately designed to wear out more quickly to increase drama, which is exactly what Pirelli do in Formula One. Michelin is not about that. They make tyres that compete in the 24-hour race. So I fully respect them for that. If that article was true, I believe it was. And that kind of feels like this here. Almost like manufactured drama, if you know what I mean. And maybe I just got my quick calculations wrong. Maybe, you know, the, the fuel map completely changed while I blinked or something. But it just didn't seem quite right. So for the last race of this week, it was definitely the highlight of all of them. For this week, this was my favourite event. I decided to pick an older school car, great looking one, the Aston DBR9. I thought, you know what, I'm going to kind of combine some of my strategies that I've learned in the other races this week and put them all together and see how it culminates for this 10th race. I'm going to not attempt to move up the pack. I'm going to deliberately stay at the back. I'm going to pit in at the end of lap one and I'm going to lower my fuel map to two for the entire thing to even out the fuel use and definitely have enough for the whole thing. And then just see where we end up. Well, wouldn't you know it, that strategy ended up pulling off quite nicely because not only was this a much more fun race, I came across some really cool other drivers in Ford GTs in particular. One of them was a little bit more dodgy than the other in the darker coloured car, the, the lighter one. I ended up kind of not really checking him, but definitely throwing off his line by mistake through, again, that kind of square section toward the end of Daytona before you get to the long straight before the uh, start-finish line. But then, in terms of the race itself, it just flowed so much better. The fuel use was great. It allowed me to turn it back to one toward the end to get a bit more power. And ultimately, I went from legitimately being the slowest on the grid in last place. What is that, like 17th, I think? Something like that. I don't remember. 16, 17, something like that. And I ended up finishing 7th. So it was a massive uh, leap up the board. I was never going to finish first. I was not the quickest person on the race, so again, I already knew that. But to have that kind of increase was a whole lot of fun. And it was a nice way to really bring that sportsmanship rating way back up to S again, from dropping, like I said, from S to B and back up to here again. It was such an interesting arc of a week. 
I've come to the conclusion that even though I will definitely still do race A, mostly just to work towards the 50 goal, I don't really put much effort into them because it really doesn't seem necessary. It doesn't seem to affect your scores, at least not positively, and you end up with, as I said, the kind of people who don't really seem to care. You probably end up with a lot of people who've never actually done it before just jumping in and messing around. Maybe even some of which don't know that it affects their rating yet because they haven't played the game that much. So that's it for my overall thoughts this week around. Definitely a lot uh, more up and down than last week. It'll be interesting to see how next week compares and really ended strong. It was so much more fun in that last event. So I'm hoping for more of that. Maybe my strategy moving forward will be a little bit more of that almost antithesis to racing where I'm deliberately hanging back and almost being like a vulture, you know, like waiting for people to make mistakes and then just take their place from them rather than fighting actively to overtake them. Because sometimes just being behind someone can stress them out enough to start making mistakes. That's something which many of us know anyway, but seeing that in action was quite interesting. Overall though, that's it for the highlights this week. Of course, join me for episode three next week of moving toward my goal of getting the Platinum Trophy finally in GT7. And of course, if you race this week, I'd love to hear some of your highlights as well. But for now, thanks for watching.